look at that beat. Oh, oh, hello. I see you over there. Hello. You're right on time, I guess. Hello. If you don't remember me, I hope you don't, because <laughs> I remember you. Anyways, my name is Professor Arthur Pod. I'm a resident entomologist, world renowned. I hail from Great Britain. I travel the world in search of my favorite animals, insects, and their relatives. And here we are today in a beautiful goldenrod meadow at Beaver Lake Nature Center. So I thought I'd take you on a little journey into the marvelous world of insects and their relatives known as arthropods. So let's start looking for what we can find. I was over there in the midst of this goldenrod field. In fact, the people will call this a jungle, a goldenrod jungle. And like the jungles of the tropics and the Amazon, they're, they're rich in life. This would be considered an old field. Long ago, this area was farmed. Look over there, a monarch, as we speak. Hopefully she'll come closer. We'll talk more about that as we go. But this was farmed and then it slowly returned to a field system. First, small grasses were growing, and then eventually we have this beautiful, lush, literal forest of goldenrod. There's different kinds of goldenrod, but we'll just call these goldenrod. It smells beautiful. Now, don't think that these will cause allergies. As you'll see in a moment, they are pollinated by insects right on time. We've got a honeybee and another type of bee which is a native pollinator. Look at that honeybee. I'll try to hold... Oh, it just flew away. Oh, no, it didn't. Look at this. this even this one stem that I'm holding. There's a bumblebee. It's as if we're staging this. This is the perfect time of year to see all of these hymenopterans, in other words, wasps and bees, on these plants. They're in search for tasty nectar, of course. And in the process, they get pollen on their hind legs, bring it to the next flower, and hence we have pollination. There's other plants mixed in with the goldenrod. I see a, a dog bane and a milkweed next to each other. They're both in the same group. And on the dog bane, if we can see that shiny, 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 shiny beetle. That's why I exclaimed over there, before I realized you were here already, about this, be oh, this beetle, a dog bane beetle. Dog bane is a toxic plant, as is milkweed. Now, we just saw a monarch flying through the field. Hopefully, we'll see another one. As everyone knows, that monarchs feed on milkweed. Milkweed gets its name from the fact that when you break off a stem, a milky white substance, the sap comes out. Now, this, this has a, a toxin. It's actually a cardiac glycoside. In other words, it will affect your heart. It also makes the caterpillar and the ma butterfly adult taste very bad. It causes the bird or the animal to, that's eating it to get sick. Hopefully, remembering the next time, I will not eat the monarch, and we'll look for that butterfly soon. Bright orange. This time of year, they're coming to feed because they've got a long journey to northern Mexico. There's a giant fly over here, if we can see it. I don't know if I can, I'm not, I have these nets, but I'm gonna avoid trying to catch these. If you can see that fly, as we saw a bumblebee, but that fly mimics bumblebees. Now you ask, why would a fly want to pretend that it's a bumblebee? Well, think about it. Bumblebees can sting and protect themselves through stinging. Flies have no stinger. The only way they can protect themselves is to either be camouflaged or fly real fast, which they, they're pretty good at. But imagine if you could pretend that you're a stinging insect. You would have even more of a defense. And that giant fly that we just saw is a mimic of bumblebees. I just saw over here on this milkweed. I'm gonna put my nets down. We don't need to catch them today. I just always come prepared. Any entomologist knows to be prepared. I see a grasshopper on the back of this milkweed. Now, I can guarantee you that it will 
It might jump when I move this, but let's just see if we can get a closer look. Are we seeing it? There it is. Are we getting a look at it? Yes, apparently we are. It's a red-legged grasshopper. Now, grasshoppers aren't pollinators. They wouldn't go after nectar, but they feed on plants. And this is a female. I can tell by her long abdomen that she's full of eggs. Adult females will lay eggs this time of year by sticking their long ovipositor in the dirt, depositing their eggs, and they will overwinter. And when they hatch out in the spring, tiny, tiny grasshoppers come up. There it goes. They're good flyers too. We can talk more about the metamorphosis of insects as we go along. I noticed something in this, you know, besides all the, the dynamic insects that are flying around or hopping or like feeding. In fact, if you listen, I can just be quiet for a moment. It's very difficult, but I'll try my best to stop talking for a moment so we can hear these. Again, all of these insects that are related to grass. There's a moth. Beautiful butterfly. So besides all the dynamic insects like that monarch or the grasshopper that helped all these bumblebees and bees and other native pollinators, we have insects that are living inside the stems of these goldenrod. There are two types of insects that use the goldenrod for their sort of their homes. They form what's called a gall. You may ask, what is a gall? I mean, I have a lot of gall, but that's a different kind. Of course, it's a pun, and it's very bad. But anyways, galls are formed with an insect or an arthropod, a relative of an insect, like a, a mite or what have you, will lay an egg on the stem. The egg and the insect releases a compound that mimics the growth hormones of the plant and then creates a swelling, in this case, around the egg. This is the gall of a moth. Inside, there's a larva that's growing and eating the pith or the inner part of the stem that has been swollen around it. So it also protects it from uh, any predation. So that's one example of a goldenrod gall, the ball gall. It even rhymes. And I'm looking now for the fly that creates a gall. It looks like there's one right here. It forms a, a giant cluster of leaves. In fact, it created this strange growth pattern on the goldenrod. It's almost the same thing that happens if you trimmed the top of the stem, the apical meristem, the growing stem of the plant, the top, and it's created this giant, kind of a witch's broom of foliage. And within there is, a, there's a little beetle. I'll, I'll get out of your way in a second. Oh my gosh, a honeybee. People, don't worry, they won't sting you unless you're attacking their nest for protection. Anyways, inside the fly maggot, as they're known, I've been called worse, uh, inside of this giant mass of leaves. Again, feeding on the inner part of the plant, protected and camouflaged from predation. There are other bees and wasps. I saw a paper wasp. Let's, wa let's wander along and see what else we can see. Oh, there's another dog bane beetle down there. Aren't they beautiful? Now they, are, they accumulate toxins as well. Like the monarch, since they're feeding on dog bane, which is actually more toxic in some ways than the relative common milkweed, which is this plant. So they become shiny. They've adapted a very shiny, bright color to warn predators that they're toxic. Like these bees and wasps have yellows and oranges and reds. Monarchs are bright orange. It's called warning coloration to warn off that, you know, we, we are toxic in the case of the monarch or the dog bay beetle, or they can sting. So therefore, the predator won't waste their time. They'll stay away. 
You know, it doesn't make much sense for insect to get eaten and later, you know, they the predator finds out that they're toxic. You want to be uh, warning them before they're attacked. Unbelievable. I love this place. Check it out. Now the the insects that we're hearing, all the crickets and the grasshoppers have matured this late summer, early fall period, and they're calling to attract a mate. And like I showed you, that female grasshopper is ready to lay eggs. So she apparently has already mated. And the, the young are born hatched out of eggs in the early spring, mid-spring, and they're, they're tiny replicas of the adult. And they grow through various stages called instars, and they molt and get bigger, but they look like the adult all the way through. And the only difference is the adult has wings and is ready to mate. Monarch butterflies, on the other hand, and flies, I talked about, or that gall moth, they start off as a larva of some type, and they change in through a pupa, a cocoon in the case of some moths, in a new adult. That's a different type of change. The first, with the katydids, the grasshoppers, and crickets, is called an incomplete metamorphosis. It's incomplete in that they kind of look the same, but a complete change, like the butterflies and the moths and the flies, the larva looks completely different than the adults, so they go through an entire complete change, a complete metamorphosis. Let's see what else we can find. It's just fascinating. Even without collecting or sampling, I brought a couple nets. One, the finer mesh is to collect butterflies and insects with uh, very tender wings. The other one's called a sweep net. It's much thicker muslin. There's another white butterfly. I don't know if we can see that or not. Oh. There's the monarch over here. The white butterfly is the most common butterfly in the world. It's known as the cabbage butterfly. It feeds on brassica, any members of the cabbage family like broccoli. In fact, I cooked up some broccoli from a garden last night and I was over at a friend's house and the daughters found a little lava into their broccoli. It was dead because it was microwaved, but at any rate, it, uh, the cabbage butterfly blends in with these green caterpillars. These purple flowers grow amongst the goldenrod, and these are an aster. I believe this is New England aster. There's a New York aster, too. I started saying, since we see the butterfly, the monarch butterfly, they migrate. They're an insect that migrates farther than any other insect, thousands of miles, 1,500 or more miles. At any rate, this generation is called the super generation. They make the trip non all the way from, in this case, Beaver Lake Nature Center to northern Mexico to overwinter in the mountains where they, they create giant colonies hanging on these, the pine trees there. So in the next spring, next year, when they come out of their dormancy, they will start migrating northward again but there's at least two to three generations that occur between Mexico and here, Beaver Lake. So they'll go along the Rio Grande River, lay their eggs, and that one will die. The one that flew all the way down last year. And then there'll be another flight up into the maybe South Carolina, North Carolina, those states, Southeast, and they'll lay some eggs another generation. Then the third one or so, will come up to the north and breed. And then they'll grow through the summer as caterpillars, pupate, called chrysalises, and then make the long journey. So these guys and girls that you see flying around are just trying to fuel up for that long, long flight. So today's a nice warm day, plenty of goldenrod nectar, so they should have a good trip. That's an amazing thing to think about. So, see, mainly the same kind of insects. What I'm looking for close in the uh, golden rod are insects called ambush bugs. They are so perfectly camouflaged that they look just like a little flower of the golden rod. And they wait, in, as their name implies, to ambush other insects, including larger insects like bumblebees. There's also an, an, an arachnid, a spider, that's called the crab spider, that's perfectly camouflaged as well. 
to that lives in these flowers. So if we look, we might make discover one along the edge of this trail. That bees, from that honeybees, gotcha. The special combs on its hind legs. It's full of pollen. They'll still take take it back and the nectar to the hive to create the honey. Let's see if we can find. It's really good. Makes me feel good inside to see this many honeybees, for sure. So goldenrod is not a weed. It's a native plant. It's very important. Like I said, it's the myth that it causes you to sneeze or have allergies. It's insect pollinated. The pollen is too big to get airborne. You might smell the flower like you do other flowers, of course, but that's not the pollen. That's just another attractant for these insects. The plants this time of year that cause uh, allergies are ragweed and mugwort and, and these other roadside quote-unquote weeds that you see. So if you created a pollinator garden, I would include goldenrod, New England aster, and plants like that. Native plants. We can have another session sometime talking about the pollinators, but I see a lot of introduced pollinators like the European honeybee and also non-native pollinators. So, as we know, the plight of the honeybee, but not the flight of the honeybee, that's a, that's a beautiful symphony, but anyways, the plight of the honeybee is somewhat dire, but this is very encouraging. Here at Beaver Lake, it's a nature preserve. We protect them. One way to protect them is to manage this field. Now, this is the 50th year of Beaver Lake. In fact, in October, marks 50 years. Now, when this nature center first opened, this was a farm field. Then slowly, like I said, it started maturing and evolving into this meadow. But it would be, it would have been in 50 years, a, a wooded area by now. These, as you see, there are some trees already colonizing. Shrubs, trees, eventually this would be forest. If we had let this go for 50 years, we'd be walking in a forest right now. But to help out these pollinators and all these insects and other mammals like the groundhog and the deer and rabbit that like meadows this is periodically cut so to keep it at this stage of what we call plant succession keep this in an old field as we call it habitat and this specific habitat that we just learned about today is this fascinating goldenrod jungle thank you for coming and keep in touch, I will be back with more about insects.